Welcome everyone. It is 3 p.m. and it's time for the server room show. This is episode 30. Thank you for SDF Public Unix System for hosting the server. As always, you can find all the links at uh, victormadras.freeshell.net. You can find uh, links how to listen to the audio, how to watch the live stream on twitch.tv slash victormadras, and uh, links for the previous recordings, both video and audio in a form of podcast you can find on those links. I try to keep this introduction as always short because I was told that I was spending too much time on this stuff. And th the other reason is that uh, today being finally a historical episode, uh, episode 30, which is a big round number, uh, three on the front and zero on the back, is going to be again this kind of episodes which some of you might like and some of you probably hate this kind of mm, bit dry and uh, academic uh, kind uh, presentations uh, pretty much like a, like a history lesson uh, kind of episodes where uh, there is not much uh, free roaming for myself or my intellect but uh, I have to uh, also read from from my my notes from the show notes I, I share for this episode Probably this is going to be a two-part episode uh, again, as the topic is uh, is extensive. It's a topic I, I wanted to do from the the very beginning, and I'm uh, even showing a, a RAM BSD uh, logo on the on the lower left right on the screen. The ones who looking at the screencast, because the topic is. Uh, BSD, mm, more, more precisely the history of BSD. And as a forward, I have to uh, give uh, complete credit and, uh, and, and copyright for, uh, for this episode and, uh, and probably the second part of this episode uh, next Saturday for uh, Dr. Marshall Kirk McCusick, who is a renowned uh, computer scientist known for his extensive work on BSD Unix from the 1980s uh, to FreeBSD in the present day. The reason being that uh, this episode uh, relies heavily or completely or uh, name it as you want on the presentations and, uh, and the notes uh, and speeches done by, by Dr. Marshall Kirk McCusick himself. And also much of this information I, 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 uh, what I will try to share uh, can be also found on the, on the chapter on Berkeley Unix, uh, pages 31 to 46, in the book uh, called Open Sources, Voices from the Open Source Revolution. The another thing I have to say is uh, that please, if you are interested further uh, about uh, what this episode is trying to show the the history of BSD or free BSD itself, then uh, as this what I can present is only a very stripped down uh, version of the work of Dr. Marshall Kirk McCusick's uh, presentation, which he he gave on this topic and and his notes. Uh, actually, he is uh, he he put this whole thing together uh, in a form of a DVD. Uh, called the history of Berkeley software distributions uh, from which this episode accepts uh, the facts and the figures and the historical uh, recounting using his his presentation and his notes it is a near four hour long uh, two part presentation where he recounts the history of BSD from the very early days and includes another lecture about uh, the modern free BSD it is really a great uh, fun to watch and uh, and own, and it's uh, definitely a better recount of the events with uh, many fun facts and uh, and personality altogether uh, much better how I could do uh, myself, as you will see, and it includes much much more obviously than what you can cram uh, into in a short version in uh, in two episodes. So please consider. Uh, purchasing uh, his DVD if I remember it was around 19 or, or 20 dollars but you know how it is in uh, these things that uh, 
uh, it is available today and maybe it's not gonna be available tomorrow and and it goes away forever and the ones who bought a copy will be happy and lucky so now that we spent five minutes on the four words which i really wanted to give credit to to his work and his uh, presentation uh, let's start with the history of bsd it, it ha we have to start at uh, the atlas supervisor which was one of the early time sharing uh, and modern operating system of its time uh, from the 1960s from Manchester University uh, London, part of the Manchester project. It ran on a, on a mainframe uh, kind of computer called Atlas and Atlas II Titan. And it set up many of the principles of what time sharing uh, would actually uh, mean uh, for us in the, in the modern world. Time sharing itself is the is the concept or the or the possibility that instead of uh, all the computers' uh, capabilities and resources and uh, the CPU time being utilized by one user and uh, and uh, no one else, a single user scenario, to give away and give possibility to multiple users connecting in or connecting back to a main big computer and uh, uh, share the time or share the resources of this computer imagine uh, the memory and the cpu cycles being shared in between the processes being uh, executed and used by those various users who those various users who connect back to, to this one main computer and suddenly instead of one person uh, owning those cycles and, 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 and the resources it is divided up and, and shared uh, among the other users and it was, uh, it was something uh, forecoming in the 1960s to, to come up with something uh, which uh, worked around those uh, those principles of uh, time sharing. It was a it was an early uh, try or an early implementation. Uh, happened to be that uh, after World War II, uh, I mentioned the, in the 60s, uh, many of those scientific minds uh, came over to the United United States uh, from Europe and from from London, uh, UK in in be more uh, specific uh, reason being that there were far more research opportunities uh, even into the 1960s in the United States than uh, than ad other were other places uh, in the world this resulted that uh, there was a big project uh, started in the United States and uh, it was called Multix it was a joint project between MIT, General Electric, and Bell Labs. General Electric uh, was going to provide a special hardware because at that time they they thought that special hardware was needed to do uh, this time sharing time sharing thing uh, properly. Included rings of protection, which evolved into today's supervisor mode and user mode uh, concepts. MIT was to provide uh, the academic input and Bell Labs uh, provided the industry support. However, uh, the presentations given by Kirk McCusick, he described this as he believes that uh, actually Bell Labs, what was providing is uh, much, much of the funding, uh, the money for the project. And as I mentioned, the project the project was called Multix. It uh, used or, or ran on the General Electric 635. It was um, considered to be a mainframe at this time. Uh, interesting is e enough that uh, General Electric is no longer in the computer industry uh, as of today. There were, of course, issues around Multix. It was driven by several groups, uh, MIT, uh, General Electric, Bell Labs. Uh, many of the participants had good ideas to what time sharing should be. Mm, they would come up with, uh, with ideas, uh, they prototype it, uh, 
they convinced themselves that it was a workable idea and then they moved on to some some other uh, idea this resulted in the fact that uh, multics itself never really became a finished working product or uh, a, a functional system an operational system in the sense of the word and uh, this resulted of bell labs eventually abandoning the project as they wanted a working time sharing system and they just got tired waiting for it to be finished bell labs people who returned from the multix projects they were stuck to use uh, gecos after that which was general electric comprehensive operating supervisor it was originally a batch processing operating system for mainframes and uh, you can imagine that it was quite a letdown uh, after working uh, for these people after working in this uh, interactive time sharing uh, operating system multix to come back to geckos and uh, use again something uh, which used punch card inputs it's kind of like when you had a chance to look at the future and then you have to go back to to where you came from so it's kind of like the same feeling probably uh, these these people uh, might have had the the bell lab uh, the bell labs people and two of these guys you will uh, see that uh, parts of this uh, uh, episode uh, overlaps with the with the episode we did on unix as uh, uh, you cannot explain one without another and uh, you will you will see for example that we will mention unix again as two of these guys uh, dennis richard and thompson uh, they were determined to not to <laughs> work on this gecko system <laughs> again they had a chance to 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 look at uh, uh, multics and they said no for geckos and and uh, they started to work on an abandoned uh, pdp7 uh, it's in the late 19 uh, 1969 a pdp7 uh, mini computer from Di digital equipment corporation and uh, they got to the point where they developed what we would call today an embedded system for the pdp7 uh, so it did what they wanted the most which was playing games on it they were uh, determined that they needed a more powerful computer to do what they actually wanted to do uh, and make it as a, as a proper uh, full operating system and then uh, then it came uh, the deal the computer science department of bell labs had uh, nowhere the budget and structure what it has uh, today therefore they uh, had to approach the legal department which had a much bigger budget uh, around 1971 and they uh, formed a deal with them which uh, included the following the legal department would purchase a pdp 11 slash 20 machine and the computer science department would write a program to help the legal department with the uh, text processing this led to the development of rof which was the unix version of uh, multix runoff program which later became uh, rewritten as NROF uh, Unix and the C programming language they started to work on uh, what eventually became Unix uh, Ken Thompson started working on Unix while Dennis Ritchie was working on the C language uh, Unix originally was written in assembly language but later uh, rewritten in C language they presented Unix at the first talk about the operating system at the ACM Association for Computer Machinery Symposium on Operating System Principles in 1973 they were discussing Unix version 4 uh, at that conference uh, presumably the C language version but there is no accurate information uh, to confirm this fact mm, personally I have reached out to Ken Thompson to, to an email address I could found on his uh, website and uh, I don't know if he will ever respond to me or not but actually uh, what I asked was was this question because uh, it is also uh, 
kind of like a, an information to be confirmed if the presentation they say that the presentation was done by Ken Thompson and that what they discussed was the Unix version 4 at this conference and that presumably it was uh, with the C language uh, rewritten already. So these three facts are uh, remain to be uh, confirmed. And let's see if I'm lucky and <laughs> Ken Thompson replies to me, that would be really awesome. Uh, thing is that Unix Unix uh, struck a nerve with uh, academics. It looked cool. It gave them uh, kind of like uh, light in the end of the tunnel to break free from mainframes uh, ran by central authorities of the universities and its servants of dead bodies, uh, as known as the terminal computers, which was governed by the computer administrators. Buying a PDP 11 slash 20 for an academic department seemed like a realistic goal uh, or kind of like an obstacle to overcome uh, even if they had to slightly uh, stretch the budget versus uh, ever dreaming of owning a mainframe for their department they can govern above so that was completely out of the question and on this first conference uh, Bob Fabry uh, was present uh, who is a retired professor of UC uh, Berkeley who wanted Unix and all of these uh, utilities uh, they were discussing there on, on on this presentation and luckily enough uh, for him Ken Thompson was an old alumni of uh, UC Berkeley so it gave uh, Bob Fabry uh, kind of like an inside track and it resulted that uh, the computer science department of UC Berkeley outside of Bell Labs was, uh, was the first to get Unix version 4 which shortly after was upgraded to version 5. The Berkeley Computer Science Department was not happy running on PDP 11 slash 20. Uh, of course, they wanted to run on a newly available PDP 11 slash 45. They didn't have the money to buy one on their own, so they made a deal with uh, the Math and Stats Department around uh, 1975. But there came a compromise. The Math and Stats Department wanted nothing to do with this new experimental Unix system. They wanted to use a real operating system, uh, they called RSTS, which was DAX operating system for the PDF-11. And it resulted in uh, a rotating uh, time frame, which mean meant uh, three times eight hour periods. It was from noon to 8 p.m., 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., and 4 a.m. to noon and Unix was run in rotating time frames like noon to 8 p.m. one day, 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. the next day, and 4 a.m. to noon to the day after. 4 a.m. to noon the day after that. RSTS ran for the remaining 16 hours of each day. It resulted Unix users uh, chasing these Unix time slots around the clock until complete exhaustion and they would uh, get caught up on their sleep eventually and uh, then they got back chasing this Unix time uh, time slots uh, again. Many people wanted to run Unix so around 1974 the computer science department of Berkeley bought a PDP-11 forum which was running the latest version 5 of Unix 24 hours a day and it worked well uh, minus an hour uh, a day spent on panics, crashes, and uh, reboots. And uh, I don't have in my text, here it is. And also, professors wanted to teach uh, classes on the Unix machine. It was much better than having the graduate students punching cards, uh, but the PDP-1140 uh, doesn't have the power to support such use case, but uh, it opened up the possibility to use uh, instructional use funds from the state of California to be used to purchase a PDP-11-70, uh, which was the latest machine from DEC, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, at the time, with a one MIPS uh, processor around 1975. And uh, they purchased the machine uh, with two disk drives and uh, as you will see it uh, caused uh, some complications 
uh, it had only one, uh, only a single disk controller. The fact that Unix, in theory, was able to issue two SIG commands on each, uh, it was able to issue two SIG commands, one each, on two disk drives. The SIGs could, uh, however, overlap in time. And on whichever disk the SIG completed first, Unix could start the transfer. A transfer for the other drive would be started at a later time, as only one transfer could occur uh, at a time. And the thing is that previously at Bell Labs, they did not stress tested uh, parallel SIGs because their computer was uh, smaller. But this computer at Berkeley, this new PDP 11 70, uh, was bigger and the load average on it was uh, around 40 constantly, which uh, pretty much stress tested this, uh, this issue for them. As a result, the system was experiencing strange hangs and mm, panics. And as Ken Thompson was the one who had written the relevant disk software, therefore Berkeley called uh, Ken Thompson for help. He dialed in from New Jersey and uh, Berkeley connected him to the machine via a 300 baud acoustic coupler modem. Uh, most probably uh, that was the first instance of remote debugging in Unix. Uh, Ken Thompson figured out the issue uh, quick and uh, doing so piqued his interest and as he was due to a sabbatical leave, he decided to spend a year at Berkeley over the 1975-1976 school year. And uh, as we will see, it, uh, it was quite uh, fruitful, so to say. At the same time, uh, Bill Joy matriculated at Berkeley uh, about the fall of 1975. Uh, Bill Joy was interested in programming language research and uh, Pascal had just arrived on the, on the scene and was about to take over the world. Previously, Ken Thompson put together or, or hacked together, uh, kind of like a Pascal thing, which was a bytecode interpreter, a compiler for a subset of Pascal which complied down to bytecodes. Uh, Bill Joy worked on this and turned it, turned it into a real Pascal compiler. Not a full compiler though, but it compiled Pascal down to bytecodes which were then interpreted. He added better error handling and recovery, which allowed students to address a number of errors at once. This allowed Bill to learn Unix and this allowed him to work with Ken Thompson. Ken was administrating the system and also actively developing the kernel. Bill also learned other important things, for example, that uh, it is a good idea to do dumps uh, using the dump command. Uh, used to make a backup of file system, backup of a file system, because the disk uh, disks do fail occasionally, and people like to be able to recover their files. That's a good thing to to have. Therefore, Bill stepped into the role of uh, a system administrator after Ken left from his sabbatical. After Ken Thompson returned to Bell Labs from his sabbatical, he put together the 50 changes tape, which were 50 patches to apply to your Unix kernel to make it work better. And Bill Joy obtained uh, this tape and applied the patches. He then uh, rebuilt the kernel. That's how he learned about uh, building kernels and, and many other things. And the thing is that there is uh, there is no uh, auto configuration or auto restart uh, or things like that uh, back in this time. So it it means that the kernel had to be compiled exactly for the hardware it was uh, to be to be run on. And uh, most uh, most of the cases you had to keep two kernels around. Uh, one was compiled for one less disk than you had, and uh, you would boot this if you lost the disk. And another kernel was uh, compiled for uh, containing two, two, your two disks. Uh, Bill Joy also did a lot of editing while doing this work. 
he found that the AD editor had a lot of defiances. Then he found the EM editor written by George Kuloris of King Mary's College of London. And uh, B. Joy had a rule, uh, one of his first rules, which meant never spend a lot of time coming up with a good idea when you can steal a better one. And uh, I think that uh, this is how far I wanted to go with, uh, with this first part of uh, the episode and let the rest of the things for uh, the second part. I, I don't think there is going to be need for a, for a third part. I really will try to uh, cram it into, into two parts. The story uh, will continue from, from here. You saw that up until uh, this point, up until uh, when we started to talk about uh, Bill Joy, uh, who will be a, an important figure uh, when we talk about the history of BSD, uh, until he came into to the story, so to say, uh, the previous uh, occurrences in the story, so anything uh, before uh, we mentioned Bill Joy, was to do with Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie and the C language and uh, and the Unix. Uh, we mentioned the Unix operating system and uh, that being created. Uh, Multix, time sharing operating systems. So this is what I meant that uh, the two stories uh, kind of overlap Unix and, uh, and, and BSD because uh, from Unix uh, and the experiences with Unix uh, came came BSD and you will see that uh, as I mentioned uh, Bill Joy will be a, uh, an important figure in uh, in making uh, BSD uh, out of uh, out of his his experiences uh, he had uh, and his exposure he had both to Unix and to and to Ken Thompson, and it's it's uh, it's interesting that uh, how uh, how many little things how, uh, how many things had to happen the way uh, it did to to result in in in, in one specific uh, uh, product so to say or or, or BSD because uh, I mean just think about it uh, what if Bill Joy uh, didn't mm, matriculate at Berkeley in 1975, exactly the same time when uh, uh, Ken Thompson is there, and uh, the, the the very very person who who was developing Unix together with Dennis Ritchie, or or as we mentioned, Ken Thompson was developing Unix and Dennis Ritchie was working on on the C language. Uh, I mean. Imagine Bill Joy is not uh, doesn't matriculate to to Berkeley in the fall of 1975, or 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 the university uh, Berkeley University uh, didn't call Ken for help, and Ken uh, decides not to spend his sabbatical on uh, on the university on exactly on the school year of uh, 75 to 76 when uh, actually he 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 and Bill Joy spends uh, valuable time together so how many little things had to happen or for example the 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 issues with uh, with the uh, with Unix what they experienced in uh, in Berkeley because of the, the 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 stress they were putting on the system and he was experiencing uh, hangs and panics. Uh, how many things had to happen to, how many small things had to happen to, to, to be in a, in a good place, in a good time, uh, exactly happen uh, the way it did to, to result in, in what we call uh, BSD today. So we will uh, see uh, this story continuing next Saturday on part two of history of BSD. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice 
Have a nice day.